Mark Inc. Ministries presents the preaching and teaching of Dr. Chuck Betters of Glasgow Church in Bear, Delaware. This sermon is part of the In His Grip series that can be found along with other various resources by visiting our website at markinc.org. That's www.markinc.org. Want to welcome our TV and radio and internet audience uh, to this broadcast, and we pray that God will bless you and encourage you as you watch us, and may the word of God not return unto him void. We uh, appreciate so very much the opportunity that we have to actually minister to you from this pulpit, and hopefully faithfully, the eternal word of God. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 10. I'd like you to take one finger in Psalm 10. We'll come back to it in a moment. And take another journey, if you will, over to 1 Peter. Psalm 10 and 1 Peter. Actually, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. We have been talking about legacy building and building a spiritual legacy that will bring honor to God. That... 50 years from now, I hope you will have raised your children and your grandchildren with these legacy principles. Let me give you up front the legacy principle we talked about the last time we were together, and then we want to unpack it a little more. And it's based on Psalm 10. In Psalm 10, the writer says in verse 1, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of of trouble. You know, one of the great issues of our day is the issue of living in a postmodern era. We are living, as some call it, a post Christian era. I don't know how true that is, but I do know that our faith is being tested. Our faith is on trial. What you and I believe is going to have to come to a significant head. The lines are being more and more clearly drawn. And it is going to become, it's incumbent on you to know what you believe and then to be willing to take a stand for that in light of the attacks that inevitably are going to come and already are coming on the basic core principles of what you believe. So I want my children to learn and my grandchildren to learn this. I want them to learn that life is not always fair. And that there are people in this world who will mean them great harm. But our God, our God, who although at times may seem distant, is keeping score. And he will weigh all matters in his balance. That becomes important for you to understand when the lights go out. Maybe at times when your own faith seems incredible, not incredible good, but incredible bad, that your faith just doesn't seem to crystallize. We are going to see more and more attacks as more and more atheistic and agnostic and pluralistic principles invade our schools, invade our homes, invade our minds and our hearts. This past week, I spent time reading a book that has sold millions and millions of copies, a book written by a man named Dan Brown, who is incredibly gifted. Dan Brown calls himself a Christian, although we will see as we study this a little bit closer that he could not possibly know the God of the Bible. Dan Brown has written a book that has been circulated in many languages and from which in just a few months, will emerge a movie. Your friends, your neighbors, your cousins and uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters to whom you have witnessed over the years are going to go and see that movie. That movie, and I would encourage you to see it as well, that movie is based upon the book, The Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code has become somewhat of a phenomenon. People are talking about the code, the code. Hundreds of books, Google it online and you will see hundreds and hundreds of hits 
on the Da Vinci Code. Fundamentally, what it amounts to is this. They believe in the code that certain documents have been unearthed and that those documents, when exposed to the world, prove that Jesus Christ was not God. More so, that he was a mere human who was married to Mary of Magdala and that in that union they had children and that that lineage, that line, that special bloodline is in existence today, hidden from the world. That Christianity really did not originate with the early church, but Christianity as we know it, that which is recorded in the scriptures, was really written after AD 325, when Constantine Christianized the world. He Christianized the world, they say, for political reasons. At the time, the Roman Empire was struggling with whether or not to embrace different forms of goddess worship, pagan worship, or to embrace this newfound growing faith called the Christian faith. Constantine, according to the book, did what was political and politically correct. He Christianized the world. Then and only then did the deity of Christ come into existence. Then and only then were certain writings recorded that tell us and certain gospels that tell us of the other side of the story that up till that time was hidden from the rest of the world. The gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are negated by these so-called new gospels. A new trunkload, if you will, of documents, they say, has now exposed the truth that Jesus Christ was not really God, and that the greatest hoax and con that has ever been given to man is the con of the Christian faith. What you believe and what the Bible teaches is not true. What you and I hold too dearly about Jesus is not true, and they have so-called proof to prove it. Now, I want to encourage you to understand something. When your unsaved, agnostic, or atheistic family members, neighbors, and friends go and see this movie, they're going to come back to you and they're going to say, aha, I told you so. Hopefully, as your pastor, I will be able to educate you as to how foolish the novel is and how easily it is dismantled, how half-truths and seeds of doubt are given to us in the form of historical so-called truth. I tell you this because our faith is increasingly going to become attacked and you are going to have to know exactly what you believe. Because like a dripping faucet, these people will keep coming back. These are the same people, the same mindset, the same theology, the same philosophy that you see in such groups as the Jesus Movement, All of the liberal educators who you see interviewed on the Discovery Channel, all of those movies, those so-called investigative reports that are aired on the, uh, the Discovery Channel and other channels like that that speak of Bible characters and Bible history, always have delineated the Jesus of faith from the Christ of history or the Jesus of history from the Christ of faith. It's the same people, only now they have put it in movie form. Art form, gifted artists. One of the most gifted directors of our day is Ron Howard. Ron Howard has directed this film. One of the most gifted actors our culture has ever known is Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks will be starring in this film. It is already being promoted in the theaters and thousands and thousands, multi-million dollars worth of viewing will occur, and our book, our scriptures, our faith, our history is going to come under severe personal attack, and you need to be ready. But this is not new. This is something as old as Psalm 10. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 10 that these days, these things will happen because the arrogant and the proud man mocks the very things you believe. 
In fact, when you go over to that passage in 2 Peter chapter 3, we are warned that these days will come. You should not be surprised because we are living in the last days. And I want to tell you, we are living at the end of the last days. The last days is that period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. The scripture refers to that as the last days. Those last days will unfold in certain ways, and we will inevitably come to the end of the last days, where certain signs will be evident, one of which is there will be severe attack upon the church. There will be blasphemy arising, even from within the church. The sad part is that many of the churches that call themselves Christians today actually believe philosophically and theologically along the lines of men like Dan Brown. Dan Brown actually calls himself a Christian because he believes that as a Christian, he follows the teachings of Jesus. He likes what Jesus taught. But Jesus is one of just a myriad of philosophies or theologies one can follow in their pathway of light and that there are many different ways to understand what the truth is. But to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man will see God but by him, and to believe that there is truly a judgment waiting for those who have rejected Christ in an eternal hell, he calls ludicrous and ridiculous. But these are gifted people, and they're going to come back, and they're going to attack the very essence, the very foundations of what you believe. But don't be surprised, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3. He says, this is now my second letter I've written to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Learn how to think the right way. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. One of the theories behind the Da Vinci Code is that Peter was a jealous man that he had a very close relationship with Jesus, but was jealous of Jesus' attention that he had given to Mary of Magdala. That jealousy was incurred, and that jealousy was enraged even more when Jesus repeatedly, according to this so-called Gospel of Philip, one of the so-called Gnostic documents that have been unearthed, continually and repeatedly kissed Mary of Magdala on the lips. This infuriated Peter, and he was enraged by this attack on his position as the number one apostle. But here he writes and says, don't be surprised, verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is his coming? Where is the coming that he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as, as it has been since the beginning of creation. Where is this God you say will intervene? Where is the coming of Jesus Christ? But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's words, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Verse 6, but by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Now watch this, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. When they scoff you and they ask you, where is the coming you so vociferously speak of? When are these events going to take place? Understand this, friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. He doesn't measure time the same way we do. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. You know, it's interesting as I read those kinds of uh, apocalyptic thoughts that uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, 
many people wanted to know what role God played in all of this. He wanted to know, many people wanted to know why or where God was when all of this took place. I'll never forget the interview of uh, Dr. Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham, when she was point blank asked, how could God let something like this happen? How could God let something like this happen? Ann Graham gave a very interesting, very profound and insightful response. She said this, and I'm quoting her. I believe God is deeply saddened by this, just as we are. But for years, we've been telling God to get out of our schools, to get out of our government, to get out of our lives. And being the gentleman he is, I believe he has calmly backed out. Can we expect God to give us blessing and his protection if we demand that he leave us alone? Now, that's not a very popular message. And if I recall, Anne Graham was severely criticized for saying that. How could we dare believe that God somehow had a role in this terrible disaster? Yet we're warned in 2 Peter that that is coming. He tells us in verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, here's the question you need to ask. What kind of people ought you to be? How you ought to live your life. How you should be holy and godly as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. The one thing I am convinced of when I study the Psalms, when I study the writings of the early church, one thing I am convinced of, whenever they write concerning the ungodly, whenever they write concerning the wicked, whenever they write concerning lawless and ignorant and foolish men, whenever they write of those who oppose the gospel message you and I hold dear, they always do so with one very important caveat. They always speak of the unsaved, the ungodly man's convictions. They are committed to what they believe. They hold tenaciously to their convictions and they do not waver. Whenever they are dialoguing with those of us who claim that we have the truth, they will inevitably resort to name-calling. They will distort the facts. They will picket. They will mock. They will ridicule. They will yell. They will scream. And they will fight for what they believe in. The ungodly have convictions. But the godly at times, lack convictions. We are too easy to give in and to give up. In the face of criticism, we bow down at their altar. Somehow or another, we say we believe in a God who is sovereign, who is Lord over all creation, who is weighing in the balance the deeds of men, who will one time, at one place, and in all of the climax of human history, he will bring every single man, woman, and child before his judgment seat. We say we believe that. But what does it take? 
for us to sell out? What does it take for us to quit? I become increasingly concerned with some of our young people. I am saddened by what I see. Although there are many who are following after the Lord, it doesn't seem to take much for some of you to sell out. One of the things I try to do as a pastor is I try to stay in your world. I'm blessed in that I I have a son who basically does hands-on work with the young people in our church. So I'm able to dialogue with him as well as to do my own investigating. I am usually in the same ballpark as you are. Where you are going, what you are doing, and what you are saying. I try to make that a very, very important part of who I am and what I do. But listen closely. I visit the same websites you're on. I'm reading your websites. I've passworded myself in, and I dial you up, and I want to see what my young people are saying. I want to see what you believe. I'm looking at your pictures. I'm watching you in poses that are anti-Christ. I'm listening to you in the profiles try to pass yourself off as some sort of foul and vile and ignorant person. I'm watching you. And then when I further read your profile and they talk about, well, what do you believe? What is your faith? You put Christian. No, you're not. No, you're not. Christians don't sell out the way you have. No, you're not. You just think you are. The sad part is that you come here to clear your conscience. You think that by going to church, maybe going to the youth program, fellowshipping with some of your friends, saying praise the Lord, or I love Jesus, or throwing a log into the fire on a retreat makes you a Christian. I want to tell you something. Listen closely, young people. The days of that kind of simplistic Christianity are over. It is going to cost you a lot more to take your stand. Some of you are involved with young men and young women who don't want to have anything to do with Christ, and you say you love them. You are on fire, and you are heading for destruction. And those around you who warn you are warning you because they love you. But you have bought in to the da Vinci mindset. You have bought in to this philosophical mindset that says it's not really true. Everything you believe is not true. That what really counts is how happy you are. Now the sad part is, the sad part is that many pastors in their churches are teaching you just that. They're teaching you that what really matters is your self-image, how happy you are, whether or not you've got joy. This is arrogance. This is an arrogance that Psalm 10 tells us characterizes the ungodly. The problem is many of us, many of you have embraced the same personalities and characteristics of the arrogant man of Psalm 10. Take a look at it with me. He says, for example, in verse 2, in his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. You see, the arrogant man is arrogant toward those who have less than he does, and he schemes to take from them what they have. They jump at the opportunity to make your sorrow greater. Name-calling and lies become commonplace. Spiritual plots to bring you down increase with every one of your questions and doubts. And do you know where it usually originates? By the unbeliever saying this, does God really say? Let me tell you, parents, some of your kids are struggling with self-image. It's typical. Teenagers struggle with it all the time. They want to feel accepted. And the arrogant person stands out in front of them and senses that. They know that that person is struggling, and they'll say the right things to get them to do the wrong things. Sadly, some of your children are caving, and they're caving quickly. And even more sadly is some of you parents have actually 
encouraged it. You think it's cute. Well, it's not cute. It's arrogance. Look at verse 3. He boasts of the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy. He reviles the Lord. You see, this arrogant man is proud of his moral and spiritual rebellion. He prides himself in the fact that his chin is jutted out against God, that he's hardened in his position. I am a rebel. I think for myself. No one's going to rule over me. I am no one's property. I will bow to no man's leadership. I am who I am, and I'm proud of it. This is arrogance. The wicked man acts upon what is already in his heart and according to his nature. Verse 3 says, He boasts of the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy. He reviles the Lord. In other words, he wants to be friends with the greedy. And he doesn't want the greedy to know that he serves a living God. God is placed over here in some sort of corner, and then he wonders why when he or she is in trouble, that God has hidden his face. The very destruction of New Orleans, the very destruction of that vile, vile city, we're almost spitting right back in God's face. Even recently, when they stood up and said, what's most important is that we have Mardi Gras. We're just going to go back and do everything that we did before. It's like God fired a warning shot and nobody heard it. Nobody heard it. May I suggest to you as I read 2 Peter chapter 3, the one we read this morning, what is coming to this earth will make Katrina look like Disney World. This is but the mere beginning of sorrows. And the lines are going to be clearly drawn. Those on one side and those on the other are going to be clearly marked. Verse 4 tells us that this man is so full of himself. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, watch this, there is no room for God. My mind is filled with other things. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. So full of yourself that there is virtually no room for God. Full of pride, full of arrogance, full of things, pleasures, power, acceptance, fame, happiness. I heard a preacher this morning, I've told you in the past, this theology, not necessarily this pastor, although I believe he's one of them. These are people who are Christians. These are Christians. And I got to tell you, in the early church, let me back up for a minute. In the early church, do you know that Peter and Paul fought with each other? Do you want to know the two greatest saints of the church fought? You know what it was over? Peter was sitting down having a meal with Gentiles. But when he saw the Jews coming by, he stood up and walked away so that the Jews would not see him eating with Gentiles. His bigotry was still evident. This is a Christian who was a bigot. The Apostle Paul observed all of this and he chastised Peter. He chastised Peter. One of the greatest Christians who ever lived chastised one of the greatest Christians who ever lived because he was a bigot. Just because we err does not mean we're not Christians. I'm not saying for one moment that these people are not Christians, but I want you to ask this question. What if Paul had allowed that to go unchecked? What if in Acts 15, when the church wondered about the inclusion of the Gentiles and they held the first presbytery meeting, what would have happened if they had decided Gentiles are inferior people. Only Jews can be saved. Doctrinal error can happen even within the church. The Colossian Christians were worshiping angels. 
believing that mediaries were needed. This was Gnosticism, pure and simple. The recipients of John's writings were struggling with the deity of Christ. The Hebrew Christians were wondering whether or not the fire was worth it all, and they wanted to quit. Christians struggle with truth. Christians struggle with all these things that are in their minds. But let me tell you what's so dangerous. It's the theology that teaches this. What really matters is that you're happy. What really matters is that you're happy. And if there's anybody or anything in your life that hinders your happiness, you need to extract that so that you are happy. And that's exactly how some of you kids are thinking. What really matters is how happy I am. It doesn't matter what the truth is. There's no room in this clogged up brain for God. There's no room. And because of that, verse 5 tells us, this man has no moral compass. His ways are always prosperous. He is haughty and your laws are far from him. He sneers at all of his enemies. You know what Satan does when you have no room for God? He seems to bless the decisions that you've made that are decisions contrary to God's word. You start feeling good. I cannot tell you how many people have asked me to beg you, you young people, to marry the right person. Oh, but we love each other. We're in love. We love each other. I haven't had anybody ever stand up here and say, you know what, I really don't love this guy. They look at each other with tears streaming down, voices choking. Some have even passed out up here. <laughs> ever seen that? Funniest home videos? I can make my own funniest home videos. Nobody stands up here thinking they're doing the wrong thing. But then they find out what the nitty gritty of marriage looks like. That spotless woman has dirt. That handsome, coy man is at times evil. And marriage takes hard work. And then those marriages crumble because there's no room for God. What excited them in the first place was sex, pleasure, fulfillment, oneness. All of these things in their proper place are good. And Satan fills their minds with those things. This is what will satisfy you. This is what will make you happy. This is what will give you joy. And he gives you more and more and more and more of it. And then you've been, in, then you've been entrapped. You're in a web. And you don't know how to get out. Because in your life there's been no room for God. There's no moral compass. Look at verse 6. He says to himself, nothing will shake me. I will always be happy and never have trouble. Lust is never satisfied. You're happy today, you want more of it tomorrow. You have pleasure today, you want more of it tomorrow. You're never content. You're never satisfied. Lust is never fulfilled. I saw an interesting program the other day, an interesting interview of young women who used to be strippers. Some of the places some of you frequent. They got converted. They came to Christ. They've started a ministry to go right back into the hell holes in which they once lived and to encourage the girls to find Christ and to get out. The interviewers were asking them some very pointed questions one of which I thought was so revealing. They said, when you're involved in doing what you do, or used to do, what do you think of the men who are watching you? And one of them answered this way, we actually feel sorry for them because we know that what we're doing will not satisfy them. They will come back tomorrow and want more. And their, and their lust will never, ever be satisfied. Now, this was not a great theologian speaking. 
This was a woman who had come to faith in Christ miraculously. I thought she was extremely articulate in some of the things that she said. She kind of articulated exactly what verse 6 says. Nothing will shake me. I'll always be happy. I'll never have trouble. Covetousness is the root of all evil. The covetous man abhors the Lord, and the Lord abhors him. Verse 7, his mouth is full of curses and lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. You see, this pride turns the blessings of God into cursings. You see, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. God gives you gifts. He gives you gifts of art, science, math, history. He gives you the ability to speak. He gives you the abilities to write. He gives you the abilities to act, to enter the arts. He gives you the abilities to lead politically, socially. God gives you those gifts. Some of you, he has made very beautiful. You're physically attractive. Some are downright ugly. But even in that ugliness, there's a gift that God gives you. And on and on and on I could go. Dan Brown is an incredibly gifted writer. I read the book, and I couldn't put it down. More because the art form of the book was so incredible. Now, I know I'm advertising something that's probably contrary, is contrary to what we believe. I think you should read it. I think you should get a hold of it. You should read it. I think you should go to the movie because you need to be prepared. You need to arm yourself. But one thing you're going to see is this man's gifted. What a gifted writer. One day he's going to stand before God and God's going to ask him, what did you do with that incredible gift that I gave you? What did you do, Jessica Simpson, Paris Hilton, with all that beauty that I gave you. What'd you do, Madonna, with those wonderful abilities to use your voice? What did you do with the talents, Tom Hanks, that I gave you to act? What did you do? What did you do with what I equipped you to do? What did you do with those oratorical skills, preacher, when I stood you up and gave you a congregation to tell them the truth and you told them lies? What did you do? What did you do with the money that I gave you? What did you do with the abilities to work that I gave you? What did you do with those children I gave you? What did you do? See, he's weighing it in the balance. Verse 8, this guy is ruthless in his desire to control. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent, watching in secret for his victims. He lies in wait like a lion in cover. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in the net. His victims are crushed. They collapse. They fall under the strength. In other words, with a little heat, we sell. We cave. We quit. We compromise. This man becomes a practical atheist because he says to himself, God has forgotten. He covers his face. He never sees. I want you to notice all three verses, all three tenses in verse 11. Hebrew tenses are present, past, present, and future, which means very simply, God has never cared, nor does God care now, nor will he ever care for your needs and hurts. God is out of his life extracted because there's no room. So where is God when these horrible things happen to good people, to his people? He's ready. Notice verse 12. Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Now I want you to note the first word there, arise. That tells me that God is sitting and where's he sitting? He's sitting on his throne. Now he's being asked to rise. Do you know when a king who is about to judge judges, he is on the throne, he stands up. He holds his hand. Judgment is about to be passed. 
And he turns to you who know Christ. And marvelously, if you've not sold out, if your profession was not phony, if your faith was real, if your trust in Christ was legitimate, you know what he says to you? I have every reason to send you to hell. But I sent my son to hell for you. He died in your place. He bore all your sins. He carried all your sorrows. And in grace and mercy, he has already judged what I now stand up to judge. And he places that hand of judgment on your head in the form of a hand of blessing. And he says, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have trusted and you have not sold out. But that same king is still standing and with his left hand, he brings that unbeliever or that phony believer, the one who has sold out, he brings that person before him and he replays the VCR. He replays the events of his life and he shows him the arrogance of the Psalm 10 man. And now he does something that the world does not want to hear. Dan Brown said, to believe in a God who has said that there's only one way to salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, and that any who do not believe that are doomed to an eternal hell is ridiculous. And that God will say to that person, depart from me, you arrogant, rebellious, stubborn, unbeliever, I never knew you. And he will cast that person into an eternal hell where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and for all eternity they will bear the consequences of their own sins. Now I got to tell you something. That is not a user-friendly message. You're not going to find too many people out there that are going to stand up and say, oh, I never thought of that. They're going to say to you, you are a ridiculous person to believe in something like that. The lines are being drawn. The battle lines have been drawn. Arise, O Lord. Lift up your hand. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, O God, do see trouble and grief. You consider it to take it in your hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Call him to account for his wickedness that would not be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from the land. You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them. You listen to their cry defending the fatherless and the oppressed in order that man who is on of the earth may terrify no more. So he opens the psalm with a question. Where are you, Lord? And he ends the psalm with what? You're on the throne and you will bring to pass all you have promised. This is my challenge to you this morning. Life is not fair. You will have to suffer in this life. Your happiness is not what is paramount. The glory of God is what's paramount. And that means at times your happiness has to be given away. That you may have to suffer sorrow and pain and heartache in order to advance the cause of Christ. You may have to give up that guy you're dating. You may have to give up that relationship that defiles. It's costly. It may hurt. You may have to cry a little bit. Your heart may be broken. But whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? I want my children and my grandchildren to know that at times life is not fair and that there are mean people out there that wish them harm. I want them to know that God is sovereign and that he holds every man's heart in the balances. He has two hands, a right hand of blessing and a left hand of judgment And there is the day when he will rise from the throne and he will even the score. Let's close in prayer. Our Father and our God, there are so many people here who are compromising. 
Lord, I want our young people not to worry that I'm watching them. I want them to worry that you're watching them. I want them to be accountable, not to me, Lord, but to you. I want them to love you. And if that means they might hate me, then so be it. May they love you with all their hearts. I pray for the men and women of this church who are on the brink of selling out. May we each examine our hearts to ensure that we are in the Lord. For Lord, some of us are not even believers. And we have yet to admit that. And so by your spirit, speak in a way I cannot. Touch hearts in a way I cannot. May no one leave this place without taking a moment to commit their hearts to you, to be willing to pay the price at all costs so that they will never, ever sell out. For the days are evil and the attacks are inevitable. And what we believe will be tested in the crucible of fire. And now may the grace of God, the love of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, the very presence, person, and power of his Holy Spirit abide with each of you now until Christ comes again and forevermore. Amen. This program has been brought to you by Mark Inc. Ministries, proclaiming the truth that God is sovereign and you can trust him. Please visit us online at markinc.org to learn about other available sermons and resources.